In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-696-1030. Again, 800-696-1030. That's 800-696-1030. 800-696-1030. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. All writers are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing to full maturity. A Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services. Nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-610-9050. That's 800-610-9050. 800-610-9050. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 
$3 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Is debt beating you down? You need discipline. You need the Debt Ninja. If you've been caught in a financial trap and need to be set free, then you need the Debt Ninja. Want to stop those harassing collection calls? Start saving thousands in interest and fees and get out of debt fast? Then you need to call the Debt Ninja. The Debt Ninja will find the best companies across the country that will help you consolidate all your bills into one easy payment. Reduce your payments by 30 to 50% and get you out of debt fast. If you have unsecured debt of $10,000 or more, such as credit cards, loans, or medical bills, call the Debt Ninja for a free 15-minute consultation. Call 800-826-1246. 800-826-1246. That's 800-826-1246. Call today. The Debt Ninja. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper. And remember, I'm only as hip as my guests. And I gotta tell you people, I gotta tell you about my newest sponsor. They've been with me all month. It's called Blowfish for Hangovers. And this stuff is a lifesaver. Especially during football season. Because if you're in college or pro, you're probably having some cocktails. You may be getting drunk. But after a big night, just wake up, drop two Blowfish tablets in water, and drink it. It's super easy. It tastes great. And it's recognized by the FDA so you know it works. So here's what you do. Go to fourhangovers.com. That's F-O-R hangovers.com. F-O-R hangovers.com. Use the promo code Cooper, my last name, and you'll get 20% off your order. Or just look for Blowfish in the pain reliever aisle at CVS. So I'm telling you, this stuff is a, is a lifesaver. If you hate being hungover, you got to get some Blowfish. Follow them on Twitter. Go get them. And that's about that. Anyway, we have a great show, and I just mentioned to my guests that uh, years ago, when I waited tables in Gordon Biersch down there in Burbank, I waited on him in the patio, and he was very, very polite. Because sometimes you get you get customers who are jerks, but he was very, very polite, and he tipped me well. And uh, my guest is Corin Nemec. How you doing, Corin? Oh, I'm doing very well, very well. Uh, good to uh, to speak with you again, I should say. Well, it's funny. Did you used to have a Porsche, or do you have a Porsche? A Porsche? No, I, I did not have a, a Porsche. I've never bought a Porsche. It's, it's not really my style. Okay, because once again, years ago, I thought you, I thought I saw you driving through Burbank in a convertible. Thought it was a Porsche. I may have been wrong. It may have not been you. It was probably Jason Priestley. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so I gotta talk to you. So now, now, when did you start acting? I, I know your parents were involved in the biz, and I know you were, I believe, born in Arkansas, but were you raised in Arkansas? Or how did you start this whole, this whole career that you've been working? Is whether it's not acting, you know, uh, producing, graffitiing. When did you, when did you get that creative? Well, I mean, I, I, my, both my parents growing up, uh, were artists in their own, you know, fields. My, uh, my dad, uh, began as an architect and, uh, was, uh, living in Los Angeles where, many years before I moved out there. But he, uh, he got into the film business in the, I guess it would be the late 70s or possibly early 80s and, uh, became a set designer and later art director and, and finally production designer. Um, and, uh, has uh, been production designer on on many many uh, major movies, uh, Terminator Two, Patriot Games, The Saint, The Shadow, Ironclad, Black Hat, most recently as well. A uh, uh, bunch bunch of films. He works all the time, and uh, he's excellent at what he does. And my mom was a graphic designer in um, the music and the theater business. So uh, I was raised, uh, you know, around uh, rock concerts and and uh, uh, theater, you know, programs, whether they were musicals or plays or, or whatever. And, uh, and I, even though I was born in Arkansas, I only lived there until I was about six or so and then moved to Atlanta, Georgia, where my mom had gotten into, uh, uh, the graphic arts field there. And, 
and so eventually she she transferred with a company called Niederlander from the Fox Theater to the Pantages in Hollywood in the mid '80s, which is what brought me to Los Angeles. Now, um, no. but uh, now, now since you oh, grew, oh, no, I was gonna say since you grew up around <laughs> it, did, did you want to act? I mean, what what drew you to the the biz for you for you personally? Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, I I knew that it, in some in some way I was going to be in the arts and entertainment business. I, I didn't know what what you know what that was going to uh, manifest as, but. Uh, you know, because for instance, just as an artist, I mean, I was, I, I had been drawing my entire life. Drawing was really a, uh, you know, my, my first real passion. And, uh, and that's what got me into, uh, getting into the graffiti art was really through being into break dancing and all of that when break dancing was the hip slipping cool thing to do. So, you know, I, I was in a breaking crew and my break dancing name was Kid Cruise and, you know, I would write my break dancing name and, you know, little bubble letters and stuff with arrows coming out of it. And, you know, and eventually when break dancing became past day, you, they, when, when I started getting introduced more into like, you know, this idea of being able to, you know, to, to paint in large scale on walls and things like that, that's, I, I really inspired me, you know, cause, uh, it's a, a very interactive kind of, uh, an adventurous, uh, medium, you know, graffiti art because, uh, it's it's out in 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 the public uh, eye. It's not something you do in a in a studio, you know, alone. Uh, so that 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 was a lot of fun, and I got into the acting really because my my dad worked on the movie Goonies. He was the art director on that, and uh, when I saw that film, I had been on sets with him, and I understood the dynamics of putting together a uh, an adventure like that. And I knew that it was all pretend, but the idea that you could then come back and view yourself, you know, from a third party perspective and, and, and actually, you know, witness you living a life that isn't your own, you going on these, this adventure. That to me blew my mind. I was like, Oh my God, I can watch myself being somebody else. Like that trip really, that really tripped me out. That's what, that's what kind of inspired me to get into it. So, so I, uh, I, I got into a acting class called, um, uh, Center Stage LA that was run by a, a gentleman named Kevin McDermott that was, it's, it's been a highly, uh, reputable children's acting workshop for decades and, uh, and I was about 12 years old then and uh, I got involved in it through my friend David Van Gorder who played Waldo in the Hopper Teacher video by Van Halen. Okay. Which, you... uh, <laughs> yeah, and so we were, in, we were classmates and I was like, holy crap, you're that guy from the Hopper Teacher video? It was like the biggest video you know what I mean? The, the the previous year, when I, just before I moved out from Atlanta, so I first thing I, I happens to me when I get to school in in North Hollywood is uh, one of my classmates is the dude from the Hopper Teacher video. I was that, like, what? The, you know, that's so funny. Took me out. That's funny. Cause, yeah. So cause... he was in, he was involved in that acting in that acting workshop. So I got into the acting workshop, and and within about eight months, we did a, a uh, you know kind of a, a presentation for uh, casting, I mean, for casting directors and managers and agents and whatnot and, you know, whoever wanted to come. And uh, and then, you you know, I, I ended up signing with an agency from that and started auditioning, you know, and then it started booking jobs. Yeah. So I really started, you know, professionally at age 12 uh, and uh, began working professionally at age 12. Now, what were some of the first jobs you booked? Were they commercials? I think, didn't you do a lot of commercials when you were younger? I did a good number of commercials. Uh, yes, I, the, the first audition I ever had was for a Suzuki motorcycle commercial, and I got the I got the commercial. It was my first audition, and landed the job. It was uh, it was wild, you know. And and uh, um, I, I did a you know a number of uh, of commercials um, uh, from that point on. Uh, the, the the real the real first you know big movie that I did was. Um, with, with Francis Ford Coppola when I was about 13, uh, just turning, just about turning 13. I mean, everything happened so fast. It was pretty incredible, you know. But, uh, when, when I had, uh, turned, you know, around that age, I auditioned for, um, uh, uh, Tucker, a man in the street. Uh, yeah. And, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the audition went really well, surprisingly, and I think really what really 
got me the jaw was the fact that I looked so much like Jeff Bridges' son. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and I think that really benefited me. <laughs> Was the fact that that I, I actually looked like I could I could really be uh, you know his son. So, um, were you were you intimidated at all? I mean, when you when you got the part because Coppola is such a big name, Jeff Bridges is a big actor. You know, you've been doing commercials. I know you had done some uh, Webster episodes, I believe, before that. But this is a no, no. A Webster I did after okay. that. Actually, what came later? Uh, previous to that, I had only done um, an episode of Sidekicks with Ernie Reyes Jr. Um, and uh, and I had done another commercial. Uh, I can't remember if it was. I did a number of McDonald's commercials. I, I did actually. Me and Paul Walker did a uh, a Coke commercial together when we were about fourteen. God. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that we shot out on, on, uh, Catalina Island. And it was a huge Coke commercial. It played during the, uh, uh, they premiered the Coke commercial during the Super Bowl of 1986, I believe, or 87, one of the two. But my uncle was actually down in the Caribbean on vacation watching the Super Bowl at the, at the bar, you know, at the, at whatever resort he was at. And he's there and he looks up and suddenly the commercial comes on. He's like, like that's my nephew. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Everyone's like, "Yeah, you're full of crap." That's like, have another drink. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, he was totally tripping out. So, uh, so that you know, he's he's been my biggest fan ever since. So, what was it like uh, working with Coppola? Like going on? I mean, you're inexperienced. It's a big, it's a big movie, and, and that was a big movie. I remember when Tucker came out. It wasn't like you know, there's small movies, but that was a big budget movie, and and you know, Jeff Bridges was. Still as hot as Chris always been hot. What is it like for you being a kid and all of a sudden being on this? Uh... You know, I, I, fortunately, I was just young enough to not really get the uh, the significance of it. Uh, it really wasn't until years later when I became far more of a uh, uh, of a fan of filmmaking. You know, not just. You know, being a kid that grew up watching some movies and being on some sets, I didn't, it didn't, it didn't, you know, I didn't know, uh, I, I understood because people around me were telling me that what I was involved in was a big deal. But from my perspective, I didn't understand, you know, the, the exact magnitude of that project and the people I was working with. So it wasn't until many years later when I was more of a young adult that I look back on it and realize what an incredible, you know, experience that it, that it was, you know, to work with, with such, such a, uh, uh, a fantastic director and, and such a, uh, a, a, an incredible cast, you know, it, it was, uh, it was a trip. I mean, you know, that was, I think that was Christian Slater's first film too. Uh, and, uh, playing his, you know, his younger brother. That was, I mean, that, his career, his, as after that was just meteoric, you know, and, uh, and it was so cool to know that, you know, that I was, that I was there with him working with Martin Landau, you know, what, it, what, what, an, uh, uh, what a career that guy has had, you know, and having that opportunity and, and Frederick Forster, who, you know, who I didn't know at the time, but became, one of my favorite performances in Apocalypse Now, but I hadn't seen Apocalypse Now at that age, you know? So uh, I didn't see Apocalypse Now for the first time until I was like 16 or so, you know? And then, then I was like, wow, I worked with that director. That's crazy. And there's Frederick. I mean, I was like, dude, this is, you know? <laughs> and uh, it was, yeah, it was a trip. And, uh, you know, and Jeff Bridges, it was, uh, I ended up, running into him, I was going down to Mexico for a vacation when I was like 19 or something or 20, and I'm standing in line at, at the airport in Mexico, uh, down in Cabo San Lucas, and, and I see this guy in this really cool hat in front of me with his family and everything, beautiful you know, family, and, and he kind of turns around and glances, and it was Jeff Bridges. I was like, what? I was like, dad. He looked at me like I was crazy, and, I was like, and then he recognized me. He was like, oh, what's up? That's and funny. Gave me a big hug, and it was, a, it was a trip. It was a trip, you know. I was like, dude, how many people in the world can you know walk up behind Jeff Bridges and, and get a hug? Right, I know exactly. Especially nowadays, geez, people are so crazy. But so now, now you you, <laughs> you, you, you sit there, and this movie's done. Now, are you getting buzz? I mean, because you know, I know. Then did Webster come as a result of this movie, or how did you start yeah, it branching did, it off? Did. And 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 Webster really Webster was an offer only situation. I didn't audition for it. It was 
it all kind of came about and realistically I don't think that it was the right choice for me uh, and my career at that time when I and, and when I look back on it but uh, but the you know I was really really talked into it by my agents uh, and, and and representatives at the time and and I understand that from their perspective it was a financial it was really more of a financial choice because the, that that TV show was on its was on its final season and on its last legs and you know was was really waning in terms of its writing. It wasn't in front of a studio audience anymore. Mam and Jupiter hated each other in real life. You know it was it was not a pleasant experience as an actor to work on. You know uh, as well. But uh, but you know that said uh, the you know what really what really got me over the hump. You know, after having made the choice to, to work on that show was having done the TV special, uh, What's Alan Watching, that uh, was the Eddie Murphy Productions. Uh, Tommy Schlamme, one of the uh, uh, writer-producers from the original Saturday Night Live, was, the, was I mean, uh, no, uh, Tommy Schlamme directed it, and, um, and uh, oh gosh, his name's put in my mind now, but one of the original writers and producers from Saturday Night Live wrote and, and created it, and it was supposed to be a TV series, but we only did the one-off, but, but it was a great, it's what got me Parker Lewis, uh, the, 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 um, Clyde Phillips and Juan Diamond, uh, and, and, and Robert Lewis, they, they all, you know, were huge fans of that TV special when it came out, and, uh, they were just developing and creating Parker Lewis at that time, which was actually before, uh, uh Ferris Bueller's Day Off even came out as a movie, so, People always compare Parker Lewis to it, but I actually know for a fact that, that they were in development on it previous to that movie ever coming out. So it's more than that, uh, you know, that, that, that there was similarities there. Well, I was but, gonna... uh, but anyway, you know, I did that and then I did, I know my first name is Steven. Yeah, and, I was gonna, I was uh, that you... got me an Emmy nomination. Yeah. What? And, uh, and, that, and that's really what kind of like gave me some, some real stability and legs in the industry. Well, do you ever think back that, you know, when you did that movie, it was 1989, and no one really talked about that subject. That was, I mean, you know, it sounds weird to say, you know, it's groundbreaking, but no one, I mean, people didn't talk about that. And what was it like for you to play, it's coming off like comedies, except for, you know, Tucker wasn't a comedy, but what was it like for you to play such a heavy role? And what was it like when you got that call that you got an Emmy nomination? Because you're still a newbie. I mean, you've done some commercials, you've done some work, but to get an Emmy nomination at that age, I mean, did it just blow your mind? And, and did you get a phone call from your agent saying, hey, you got the Emmy or the Emmy nomination? How does that, how did that happen? I understood that, that you know, that, that, that there was, that there was a big push to get me the nomination that, that, that you know, I mean, I, I worked with an acting teacher named John Lynn uh, for a number of weeks to get the start of the production on, on, uh, our first thing that's been in. And what really, you're cutting out. What? You're, you're cutting oh, out. I, 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 uh, I'm sorry. Um, maybe it's my reception. I said I worked with a, a gentleman named John Lynn who was an acting teacher, uh, for several weeks in the lead up to the production of, I know my first name is Stephen and, uh, and he he really introduced me to a much deeper level of of uh, of understanding a character and developing a character and breaking down a script. Because my previous uh, um, teachers that I had worked with in, in acting before that was more you know uh, more more geared towards teaching young minds. You know what I mean? Not not really mature minds and. Uh, and so he was, you know, th this was, this was someone who probably rarely worked with kids, <laughs> you know, as an acting, uh, as an acting instructor. And he really opened me up to, uh, you know, understanding, you know, what, what it is to, to, to really create a character. And, uh, and, and so when I walked on set, they, I was really, really well rehearsed. Um, and, uh, and it was, it was pretty, it was pretty much a breeze. There, there was only a few, uh, difficult scenes that, that, uh, that I had to, that I had to really, uh, you know, work hard for, um, emotionally. But outside of that, it was, it was kind of a cakewalk. Um, Larry Ellican, the director of that, who, uh, always walked around with a cigar in his mouth and, and with, and, and with a, uh, uh you know, a, uh, nicotine soaked beard, you know what I mean? <laughs> he, he would, uh, he'd always come over to me and he'd be like, Corin, 
Are you ready for this scene? You know, it's a very emotional scene here. You know, are you going to be ready for this? You know, this is because I, I would always be like so casual around set. I'm not a method actor, so I didn't walk around in some kind of particular mood in order to, you know, maintain that. But I, I and and it was a it was a, a constant uh, uh, struggle for him to like, you know, to, to be to be nervous of, of whether or not I was prepared or not. And I was like, oh, don't worry, we are well prepared. And, uh, and it was a great experience, great work experience. Uh, and, and eventually Larry Elegant started uh, coming over to me and instead he'd be like, so Corin, you know, this is a comedy, right? <laughs> and, uh, he'd be like, oh, you know, I want you to really punch up the funny moments. And, uh, and that's, that's when we really started having, having a, uh, a good creative time working on it, uh, even though it was a dark subject. Cause you have to keep some brevity there, uh, with subjects like that. Otherwise, you know, it could become too intense. And uh, and that whole world of uh, of child uh, uh, you know child abuse and 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 molestation and all of that it, it is a very touchy subject that even to this day is rarely t- touched upon because it's it's so it's so dark you know the the uh, the average person just does not want to confront that that particular reality. There's so many other realities that we see all the time. You know, rape, murder, torture, you know, all kinds of, 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 of horrible realities that we see all the time on television and we, and we pay it almost no mind and are, 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 you know, really numb to it. But when that subject matter comes up, it always sends a shudder through the room, you know? So, uh, I think it's something that, 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 that really needs to be addressed in, in a new unit of time. You know, you, again. you think it would. I mean, you think your movie came out in 1989, and there's there's some exactly. there's some things, but now it seems to be more expressed in 2020 or Dateline, or now with the John Benet Ramsey thing, all these documentaries. But they never really just make movies about it, and like, and plus the TV movie used to be so popular. The TV movie's not really. You don't see. I mean, that was a big thing. The ABC. You know, after school I special. I think that they have. I, yeah, I, I and I, and you know, I gotta say, uh, in 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 seeing mainstream television nowadays, I think they're missing out on a real big market there. I think that there's a huge market for t- TV movies and, and miniseries. Uh, again, especially with the you know a short short attention span theater that uh, that that the world has today. You know, less is more. You know what I mean? I don't even think you need to do 22 or 26 episodes per season of a show anymore. I think 10 episodes or 12 episodes is more than enough. These uh, these days, you know. Yeah, I mean that's why HBO does that and Showtime does it, and then you you watch it and you're like, okay, and and it's easier it's easier to binge watch when there's ten episodes because you're not sitting there going, oh my god, I'm I'm four seasons behind. I have to watch ninety two episodes to catch up. It's that's that's very intimidating when you want to watch a show that everybody raves about. Yeah, and it's uh, and it's uh, you know I think the less the less is more kind of uh, approach is is always good because if you have a really good product and you deliver a smaller amount of it, then then, then the chances are that the people who who like that product are going to come back in droves, you know, in order to get you know whatever. But it, but if you give them tons of that product, they may get kind of burnt out on it. Now talking about product and series, you. Got Parker Lewis. Now, was that a long audition process? Because you know, you said you had, you had an Emmy nomination. They had seen you in the movie, uh, another movie that's supposed to be a series. How did that work out? Was there a long process? Or did well, my no, my my I mean my 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 recollection of it, you know, and 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 everybody's memory is you know is subjected to the, subjected to the you know their own perception of of, of their own their own lives, but. The way that I remember it all unfolding was because of what's Alan watching, you know, they, they, they wanted me for it, you know, from the beginning. And I, and I recall having turned down the, the prospect of, of even doing the show because I thought that it was a, a half hour multi-camera sitcom like, like, uh, Webster was. And I had a terrible experience uh, on Webster and, Found that the, that the the style of writing of sitcom was very difficult for me to do comedically. I'm good at doing comedy, but I but I come from a more organic kind of comedic place, you know that 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 kind of you know situational comedy, not necessarily dialogue driven comedy, you know, and uh, where where it's like it's the line line joke factor. It's like one person says one thing, one person says you know the setup, 
the you know then the then the you know the the middle part and then the the the, the punchline and it's always like that on these shows and so there's a a timing to it that that you a rhythm to it that you have to keep up with it's that's quite exhausting you know and um, and so I turned it down uh, on numerous occasions so I don't know if I was supposed to audition for it or not but I ended up not auditioning for it I ended up going in and having a general meeting with all the creators and they explained to me, you know, that, that they wanted, that, that it was a single camera show. They were shooting it like a film and that it was going to be done in the style of the movie Three O'Clock High with Casey Shimosko, which was an incredible film. Love that movie. And it was just, it was just so, yeah. So the cinematic style of Parker Lewis is an exact copy of, of what you saw in, in, uh, in Three O'Clock High. And, uh, I mean, exact copy of it. You know, they, they duplicated it very well. And when they explained that to me, I was like, oh, well, that's a whole different story. You know what I mean? I was under the assumption of something very different. So I, I, I came aboard the project, you know, uh, and, and did, I did audition with, uh, all the, uh, the other actors that were, that were in the, in the final running for, uh, the other characters, um, you know, on, uh, on the show. So, you know, I did do, I did read in the room with all of the guys and all of that. And I think that if, if I, if I was not doing a good job, you know, uh, in the room playing Parker Lewis, you know, reading opposite the other actors, they likely would have recast. So in a, in a way I did audition for it, you know. Now, now Fox was in its early years then. Yeah, we, it was their first time going with a full lineup. You know, before they didn't have a full lineup, and this was their their big launch to a full lineup. So we were one of their, you know, first shows that they were launching with. And uh, uh, it wasn't, you know, uh, at the end of second season was when Rupert Murdoch purchased Fox, and all the executives got let go, and a whole new tier of executives were put into place. And then they they uh, they saw the the, the ratings difference between nine hundred two one zero, which which uh, and and our show. Uh, and they, they thought that, that they needed to make our show more like 90210, but they're basing this on Nielsen ratings and the 90210 was, 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 uh, was on during the week and it was on a, you know, on a school night and was a show that was, was generally watched by the whole family. It wasn't all, it wasn't just a teen driven show. Our show was on Sunday night, early evening and was, was, Primarily watched by uh, by teens and college age kids and kids without uh, uh, the Nielsen boxes attached to the television because by the by the early nineties most most households had two TVs one for the adults one for the kids so you know they, they, there was no way that they would have known what our true ratings were because we we did a bunch of college tours doing publicity for our show uh, during the early years and it was insane the, the response that we were getting showing up at these colleges college radio stations and and local media and in, in those areas and and it was just like it was it was obvious that that our ratings weren't you know showing what what the true viewership was but but anyway long story short they they decided that they they needed to alter our show and make it more like 90210 so that's why our third season became an extremely different show parker lewis lost his his hitness he became you know uh uh, shacked up with a single girlfriend, and uh, the the chief nemesis next to the principal Lemmer disappeared from the show. Uh, you know, the whole thing toned down completely. You know, uh, a lot, all the effects toned down, the cameras, the angles, toned, everything did. And and that was really the nail in the coffin. Then they started moving us around from one night to another, and and uh, and it was kind of. Uh, you know, you kind of saw the writing on the wall that, that it was coming to an end, and it was really unfortunate because uh, I think that if they had let us just continue doing what we were doing, they would have seen that we could have gotten at least five to seven seasons out of that show, you know. Now, now what was it like, though, for you the first, like, two years? Because you're the star. Of the, I mean, you're you're Parker Lewis, and they always had you always had great shirts. It's when <laughs> Your wardrobe, you, know, you always had those cool shirts. Did people start recognizing you? And you must have been sworn by girls because your character's cool. You're a good-looking guy. How did your life change? I mean, did you notice all of a sudden that people were noticing you and recognizing you? And as you said, when you went to those colleges, well, it must have been bedlam for you. You must have had, like, because you're a cool guy on the show, you must have had, like, guys and girls just swarming you. 
at times there was there, there were moments like that, but those mainly those PR tours are are so fast and and there's so there, there's so much that you have to do in a day and in an evening and you know there's really not a lot of time you know to you know to actually go and and be around but you know much you know, so so you would really see the the crowds like when you would do uh like a campus talk or you'd be going to the campus to do the the the, the college radio station and you'd have you know a crowd of people who are like you know, just trying to check out what's going on. See, was you know what I mean? People who are fans of the show that are just trying to act like they're not, you know, they're not trying to catch a, a glimpse of who's there to do the show. You know, pretending like pretending like you know, a hundred students are all studying right in front of the, the college radio station is a normal thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it was uh, it was a trip. It was definitely a trip. But in the bubble of Hollywood, was like you didn't really get get a, a, a drift of what, you know, of what that notoriety was like, because in the bubble of Hollywood, you know, you, the, the social, the social scene that, that, that uh, I was in, that, that, that all my friends were in was filled with people who had done plenty of different types of, of things that were, you know, known and they were successful at what they were doing or were doing creative things or, you know, I mean, just from, the graffiti scene alone is, is, you know, how I met many of, of, of my friends that were, uh, became actors, successful actors or were acting like David Arquette, you know, was uh, a very well known and well respected graffiti artist in the eighties. And, and Balthazar Getty was another one. And, uh, uh, Seth Benzer, who was, uh, the lead singer from Crazy Town, okay. the band Crazy Town. He, he was, uh, one of my friends in high school. He was in the graffiti art scene and, and Yeshi Pearl, who is Mickey Avalon, he's a, a well-known alternative rap artist. Uh, he's he, I know him through the graffiti scene, and I mean, there's it just the list goes on, and it's it's pretty impressive how that that street culture, you know, was uh, was a factor in uh, in the you know in the scene that uh, that stretched beyond the streets into the entertainment world, you know, and uh, and it was uh, it was a really uh, a uh, wild time, you know, a really wild time. Now for you, because you had this cool group of friends and you also had the graffiti, were you, after Parker Lewis ended and because the the show went a different way than what you were used to, as I said, you know, you were used to the first two years and they do it at Beverly 90, and 0 were you bummed when the show left? Or were you sort of like, when it ended, or were you sort of like, you know what, I can, uh, it wasn't going my way anymore. I didn't like where it was going. I'm ready to branch out. Well, yeah, we knew. I mean, it was kind of like there was that feeling uh, all of season three that there was that that some you know that, that something was rotten in Denmark. You know what I'm saying? There was just too many, too many, you know, uh, hard charge changes coming from the top tier executive level at the at the at the network that was forcing our hand and really making the the production of the third season you know uh not as fun and enjoyable as the first two as well so there was there was a lot you know it was the, the one thing that i that that i did do that was smart was that at, you know every hiatus instead of taking the hiatus off i would make sure that i did a you know some type of dramatic movie of the week so you know each year even though the show was on i had a uh, a movie of the week, you know, on, you know, CBS or a movie of the week on NBC or, you know, so I was keeping my, my, uh, uh, my dramatic acting, you know, out there and keeping that up. And, uh, and, and that was certainly a lifesaver because there was, you know, the, and still is a, a kind of a, a hangover from the, 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 the portrayal of Parker Lewis. Uh, at least within the industry, you know, you kind of get categorized with all of the other 80s uh, child stars, even though our show didn't come on until the 90s. <laughs> right. But, you know, you get just categorized and jumbled into that whole, you know, group. And, and you know, I, I just felt not necessarily that I was different than any of them, you know, because I'm not differentiating myself from other, from, from people who are just professionally working as actors. But the one thing that I did do was I maintained you know, a, a close relationship with, uh, with, um, theater companies and, and acting workshops and, and continued studying even up through the days on Parker Lewis and, uh, 
And after Parker Lewis, you know, transferring into a, a company called uh, American Repertory Company, which was uh, directed by Manu Tupo, who was just an incredible uh, actor, uh, and and he was uh, a senior member of the Actors Studio and had studied with Uta Hagen and and uh, and 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 Stella Adler and and you know many of the the originators of of, of the new um, methods of, of acting. Uh, that were introduced in New York, you know, back in the day in the, in the, in the fifties. And, uh, and, you know, so this, this, this guy was, yeah, I studied with him for 11 years until I was in my thirties and, uh, until he passed away really. And, and so, you know, I, that staying that closely connected the, uh, to that world, to what the reason I started acting was, was, was essential because it's easy to get, um, to get things misconstrued when you're inside the bubble, you know, if you start believing your own media, if you start believing your own hype, uh, it, the, the ego can play games with your mind and, and have you, you know, uh, or ha- have you behaving as if you're, you're a star or as if you're, you know, a celebrity or as a, instead of just being an actor, you know, like my teacher always was, was constantly counted into our heads is like, you're not an actor. You know, the only time you're an actor is when you're acting. So if you're wandering through life thinking that you're an actor, you're lying to yourself because you can't be an actor unless you're acting. So if you're out in life acting, then you're not being, then you're not behaving. You know, so you can't be an actor, you know, but you can act. Right. And, uh, and, and so it was a, it was a, it was a real trip. He, he, you know, I met him just at the right time because Coming off of Parker Lewis, it was, there was definitely that, you know, kind of holy, sh- you know, crap moment. You know, what do I do? Where, 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 where do we go from here? But I knew that I would work. I just didn't, you know, I, I had just had a, 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 a child, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, my ex, my now ex-wife, you know, uh, who became my wife, uh, after, after our daughter was born. But she, you know, I was like, you know, now I have a kid. Like, this is like no joke. I can't just, you know, it's not, it's the, the, I don't have the freedom to go, okay, cool. I'm going to take the money I've made from this. I'm going to go back to college and I'm going to, you know, learn this, you know, like Troy Slayton, who played Jerry Steiner on Parker Lewis, you know, he took the money from the show and he kept acting here and there doing his thing, but he went to UCLA and, and got a criminal law degree and now is a very successful criminal defense attorney and, uh, and still a, a very good friend of mine. And, uh, and, you know, so, so he, he took, you know, what, you know, the, the, uh, the, the money and success that he had at a young age and he folded that into, you know, a far more reliable career than, you know, pursuing a, a career in the arts and entertainment industry, which is, which is really a, uh, it's a very, very tough world to survive in, you know, long term, you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's ups and downs. I mean, I, I get that with all my guests all the time. You know, you, you come off a series, but then when you were lucky, I mean, now, did you shoot The Stand after Parker Lewis, or was that one of your hiatus shows? No, The Stand, yeah, that came after Parker Lewis. I think that was about a year and a half or so after the uh, after the show ended uh, when I got that job. And I was so excited for that, you know. I mean, it was, you know, it, it, that that was something that, that I, I just, I, I was... I did not think in a million years I was going to get the part because I didn't, I didn't match at all the description of the character. But, uh, fortunately for me, um, unbeknownst to me, I had auditioned a number of years earlier for a film called Sleepwalkers, uh, that, uh, that Mick Garris directed, who had also was the director on, um, on the stand. And he, he really wanted me for Sleepwalkers because he thought that I did a performance that was, that, that was right for the, the, the part, but they, they didn't think that I had the physical attributes of the character. So come full circle, now we're at this, doing the stand and the character Harold Louder is written as like, you know, an obese 300 plus pound, uh, uh, you know, young, uh, uh, young adult and, uh, and I'm, and I'm skinny. You know what I mean? And so I was like, well, they want me to read for it, so I'll go read for it because apparently they had read as many people that, that, that looked like the, the, the character as possible and they couldn't find anybody that, that, that could play the character like they wanted. And, and Mick Garris kept telling, uh, uh, Stephen King that, that he believed I could do it and they finally brought me in. 
And I did the audition, and, and they, they offered me the part. I was beside myself. I was like, I, I, this is so right for me, but I'm so wrong for it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, but they they uh, they gave me the chance to do it, and, and it was just, it's one of my favorite uh, jobs that I've ever had, had the opportunity to work on. And again, what a cast, you know? Oh, yeah. Getting to work with, with all of those, uh, you know, Gary Sinise, Rob Lowe, uh, Molly Ringwald, you know, Ruby D, Laura San Giacomo. I mean, the list just goes on. The, the, uh, the actors that were on that and getting to work personally with Stephen King was incredible, you know? And, you and uh, and then even, I mean, thinking back, uh, even along those lines, I did a, a film when I was 17 called Solar Crisis, which was a large budget sci-fi feature that didn't turn out that well. Uh, but it was a huge budget and, and I got to work with, you know, Peter Boyle and Jack Palance and Charlton Heston. You know, and, and, and it was, I was just like, this is, when I look back on the, and, and then I was old enough to realize, wow, I'm working with, with Moses. Right. You know, I, I knew, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I was like, this is some cool shit, you know, uh, and, uh, I was very, very excited about that. Um, and, and Jack Palance as well. I was very familiar with who he was. I, and Peter Boyle from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, I was totally familiar with who he was and, uh, you know, and I was just, you know, and looking back, I've, I've had the opportunity over these years to really work with some some fantastic actors, you know, uh, uh, and um, uh, just I, I'm just so blessed that that, that I've had those opportunities, uh, you know, along the way. Well, you you had said about the sci-fi world, and now the sci-fi world is so big because conventions and stuff like that. You ended up being on Stargate, which also had a huge following. So you, it seems like you know Parker Lewis had a cult following. The Stand, most people watched it, and Stephen King has a following. Then you know down the road you end up on Stargate. What was that like to get in that in that role? And then that's another show. As I said, these shows have this really cool following. How did you end up getting on Stargate? And did you did that introduce you to a whole new fan base? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely introduced me to a whole new fan base, uh, and has been, uh, really just an, an incredible experience, uh, uh, across the board. Um, I, I really got it because I was in, I was, you know, in the right place at the right time. Uh, I was at MGM corporate headquarters in LA uh, auditioning for something totally different, and the casting directors for Stargate passed by, you know, where I was sitting. Uh, reading for for a totally different casting company, you know, in a different building, but they just passed by, and I had, I had auditioned for them many times over the years for other projects, and just hadn't read for them in a long time, and uh, and and we just started having a conversation, and and they just like were like, hey, you know, we just got the breakdown for Stargate, this could be right for you, and and uh, and it uh, it just turned it turned out. It, it turned out in my favor that time, you know, it was great. I, I would have loved to have been able to do the show a bit longer than, than my character did do the show, but, uh, but, you know, I, I was afforded the opportunity to do a really memorable role that has resonated with the fan base, you know, as if I was on all of the seasons, you know, so, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been pretty incredible. Now, do you get that convention? gig now because people know the show and because of your cast for your work and you also did Supernatural do you do you hit the convention circuit because uh, it seems I like I do some I, I don't have I don't have uh, you know a convention agent so you know there, there's there's not many that I do um, nowadays I, I'm sure that if uh, you know that, that I could probably do more but uh, but I, I do some. Uh, I'm actually going over to Switzerland uh, next month to, to do one. I I, I tend to, to do uh, conventions outside of the country more than inside the country for some reason. But uh, but that's fine with me because I, I I don't mind the travel and adventure. Now you're acting. You know you, you're on these different shows. Now tell me about the, uh, the I believe it was a web series, Starving. How did that come about? Well, starving, you know, me and David Faustino, uh, have been friends for many years, uh, since we were, you know, teenagers and, uh, and we have a long history together, especially both being on Fox, you know, at the same time and, uh, and the child star syndrome and all of that. And, and we, we had been, uh, developing some, some, uh, some projects that, uh, we had a, a small production company together with a partner of ours, uh, and, uh, 
we uh, we had done a project, one of our first projects that we produced and, and created and developed was with Neil Strauss, and it was uh, a MySpace original. It was, it was uh, produced and, and, and financed by MySpace and 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 Harper Collins, and we did uh, he, his book Rules of the Game, which was like a, a how-to handbook for graffiti art. I mean for uh, for pickup artists, um, and we we did a competition series for him that was that was uh, a promotional tool for his book as well. That actually was huge. It got well over five million views on on MySpace at the time, and uh, and it, it was shocking to, to to see the MySpace within several years after that was pretty much gone. <laughs> but uh, but but that that uh, that that gave us some credibility as a production company and all of that, and and. Uh, and we had been shopping a, a, a number of, uh, of projects, film projects and TV projects around that were, you know, highly scripted and, and all of that and, uh, and really weren't getting any traction. And then the, the, the TV show, The Two Corys, had come out and we just couldn't believe it. We're like, you know, and, and, and I knew uh, 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 both of them uh, somewhat back in the day, even though we, we hung out in very different social groups. You know, I, I had known both of them uh, in in a peripheral kind of uh, uh, manner, and uh, and so you know we, we we just were like, wow, these guys got like their own reality show or whatever. We're like, you know, re- really, what we should do is like because we know that when we would go and pitch, you know, shows uh, to the networks, the networks would uh, would many times pitch back to us, you know, their version of what they wanted to do with us. You know what I'm saying? And we were just like, if we do their version, you know, of what they want to do, we'll just be, we'll be destroyed. We'll, it'll, it'll ruin us. Right. And our partner, Todd Bringawatt, he was like, he was like, you know what? If, if, if they want to ruin us so bad, if they want to like make complete asses out of you guys so bad, and they don't want to do a legitimate, you know, scripted comedy with you guys, they want to just do some, you know, 80s, you know, throwback, you know, uh, soft, soft scripted reality show. Let's just do our version of that. And we came up with the idea of, you know, Corin Nemec and David Faustino, uh, living together in a, in a rundown Hollywood Hills house, trying to get their careers back. And, uh, and we shot a, a presentation for it that was really hilarious. Uh, Ed O'Neill was gracious enough, um, to work with us on that, one of our writer producers on the show, Sam Cass, was a was a good friend of Ed O'Neill's, as as of course um, Faustino was, and uh, and uh, Sam Cass was was a writer producer from Seinfeld and a bunch of other great shows, and and was a, was a brilliant comedic uh, is a brilliant comedic mind, and he he was part of our creative team, uh, and and so we shot the, the presentation for it, and we took that out, and and I tell you, you know. We came so close to selling it to a major network so many times, and it was just so far fetched that like they just kept passing on it. And finally, we went to alternative media outlets and and pitched it to, to you know the uh, over at Sony Television for Crackle Network, and uh, and they ended up picking it up finally, and they gave us a really strong budget for it, and and we and we delivered. What we thought was was really really hilarious, rated R, you know, uh, no holds barred comedy. Uh, unfortunately for us, we offended some of the executives at Sony Television. Uh, we, we we didn't have uh, like by the time we delivered our final episode, uh, for whatever reason, our content was offensive to a number of the executives, and they stopped championing us. Um, uh, which I was very shocked by because they they had script approval on every script, so that's when I realized they likely didn't read any of them. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know they they stopped championing the show, even though it was a massive uh, success for the launch of Crackle. It, it just delivered it delivered a, a, a huge viewership for them, and uh, and it wasn't pursued any further. But uh, and in fact, you can't even find it online anymore. See that sucks. Uh, that it's, sucks. Not, it's not even on Hulu. It's nowhere. It's just it's non-existent, and it's a it's it's very strange. I don't know if that's because we had a huge ad rev share deal with uh with Sony TV that they pulled it because they don't want to pay anybody. But that could be that could be why. <laughs> so now you you did that. Now how did you end up on Supernatural? Because once again, another show with a huge cult following. I had I had a friend of mine was on the show, Lex Medlin, and he played. 
a Cupid in a diaper. And, you know, you think that's not a big role. And then he said his wife noticed on, in social media he was getting all these messages from French girls. And he goes, um, he, his idea was, he goes, I guess French girls like chubby guys in diapers. But it has that, like, that follow That's hilarious. How did Supernatural go? I mean, how did you get that? And then did you see some Twitter Twitter jumps off that? Because people really love that show. I, I just auditioned for it, you know? It just came through as an audition, and I went in and read for it and, uh, and, and, and got the job, uh, you know? So that, that's, that's, it was really as simple as that. Um, so I can't, you know, I mean, that, 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 that just worked out just in, in a really organic way. Now, did you start seeing a different fan base? People going, oh, yeah, because I said it seems to draw a lot of young fans. Well, surprisingly, the, the, the largest fan base for Supernatural is, is, uh, 30 plus women, uh, uh, single and married. The, that's their that's their strongest fan base. It's almost the same fan base that that uh, that soap operas had in the eighties. <laughs> so that, that's cool. So you got you got a whole new group of fans, though. Yeah, it's, no, it's, it's great, and uh, and you know that show. Uh, it, it's it, it's a really really good show. Uh, very well produced, very well written. Uh, the 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 acting on, on it is is really uh, up to par and. The, Directing uh, everything about it, it's 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 an extremely well produced show, and uh, and it was uh, it's it's always great to, to have the opportunity to uh, to be involved in you know in, in high end uh, shows like that. Now these days, how are you still involved in the graffiti art world? Because you've been around for a long time, and you know it, through people like Banksy and stuff like that, graffiti art has become more commercial. Have you, I mean, how have you developed as a graffiti artist and are you still very active doing that? And is it, you know, as you get older, is it not as fun? Cause I'm sure when you were younger, you were doing some renegade stuff cause you always see, you know, you see graffiti. It's so funny. You see graffiti sometimes in the most insane places and you look and you go, how the hell did they get there and not get caught? Well, you know, for, for what it's worth, but, you know, I mean, I, I, I was still, uh, going and painting murals at graffiti yards during the time period I was on Parker Lewis as well. And, uh, uh, and most of the graffiti yards were, were ones that were like, they, they weren't legal, you know, but they, but they were kind of, uh, overlooked by, by the law, so to speak, because they were, they were not seen from the street. You know, these are walls down train tracks or, you know, uh, uh, you know, way down in, you know, in the backs of some deep alleys or whatever, you know, just places where the cops are like, fine, you can paint there, just don't, just don't bring it to the street, you right. know, kind of deal. And, uh, so I mean, I was still involved, uh, uh, for sure. Um, I, I did get, get more into, to journalistic style photography for, for quite a while in my twenties. Uh, but I never, I never left, uh, you know, the graffiti culture or, or the, or graffiti art, uh, the art form, um, uh, behind and, uh, and then ended up connecting up with one of my, one of the guys from the graffiti crew that I was in when I was a teenager, when I was, uh, in my early thirties and, uh, and we started painting together again a lot. And, uh, and that's really when, when I got, you know, that, that reignited my love and passion for, uh, for the art form and for the, the, the culture and for the experience. And, uh, and then as the, as the art forms, uh, uh, started to develop and, and the, the, uh, uh, the idea, the, well, the style of stencil art and, uh, or medium of stencil art and, and poster art, uh, became, you know, popularized. It, it really, a lot of my friends who were, were, were from the old school graffiti art scene, were not a, not really embracing this new art form, and uh, and me and uh, some of my friends decided that we would go the opposite way, and and totally embrace it and compete in the in in that world, you know. So uh, it's it's been a lot of fun because now I'm not I don't just you know paint graffiti art. Uh, I'm, I also you know understand the the uh, the stencil art and the you know the the dynamics of poster art so i've gotten in more into graphic art design work uh versus uh versus sketching and and painting uh so 
it's it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. I, I I in the last couple of years, I've been developing with a business partner of mine um, a company called Planet Street. Uh, we have a a kind of a, a beta phase site set up right now called PlanetStreet.com that you can go and check out. And it's uh, you know it's going to be a um, uh, a site that is a media site for graffiti, or not just the graffiti culture, but the the, uh, the urban art scene culture, which which uh, which embraces graffiti art as well as many other kinds of uh, of, of of aspects of, of the of the urban culture, from street foods to street sports to anything else in, in that you know will all fall under the same umbrella. But uh, but right now we're launching with graffiti and street art as our as our primary focus and uh, and and we'll be developing that into a merchandising uh, uh, site as well where you can where you can get original art from the artists that you uh, you know that that you like or you know from uh, from the street culture. Now on your Twitter, the Sid lives picture is that yours? Yes, I painted that. Now, where'd you paint it at? And then it just because that's that... actually on the back of a of a very famous um, punk rock clothing store uh, on Melrose Avenue in Hollywood. Um, it's uh, it's been around since the '80s, and it's been the place to go to get your Doc Martens or your Creepers or you know your Sex Pistols shirts or you know your suspenders or whatever the case may be. And, uh, and the, the back area of, uh, you know, the, the, that area of Melrose had always been known to be rather grungy, but, uh, but the, the, the back area of their store was really, uh, run down and, and tagged up and, uh, and in bad shape. And so, uh, uh, having had a few conversations with the, uh, with the owner and having painted a number of murals around the area, uh, was able to get, get the entire backside of their store. So, you know, there's a, it's, it, there's a lot of murals back there that I was involved in that, uh, that I'm, uh, I'm very proud of. And that's definitely one of them. And the fact that it's on the back of a, of a, uh, uh, you know, iconic store there in Hollywood, it kind of goes along with it. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it, it becomes sort of a uh, part of the city landscape, you know? That store, you know, you know that store with the giant Sid Vicious mural on the back? Right. <laughs> like, you know, that, that's what I want people to say. How long did that take you to paint? Um, that didn't actually, it, it, it was, it, it was a little quicker than, than expected, but uh, I, I got, uh, I got some, cause it's a difficult space to paint. It's on a second story, uh, on a, on a small kind of, uh, there's, a, there's not a lot of space up there to put your ladder and it's really high. It's so really tall. It's it's probably you know, fifteen feet high or, or more, uh, and uh, so it's deceptive in the photo. You can't tell, you know, what it's like. But it's sketchy to paint up there. So I had a buddy of mine uh, who goes by the name Dirk Cobain. Uh, he uh, he helped me get that uh, get it all filled in and everything. So we were able to complete the whole thing in about six hours. Now, are you still actively? Uh, doing the graffiti art, or are you just concentrating more on that website? Yeah, I have a. I mean, I have a number of murals waiting for me back in LA. Uh, I, I live, uh, um, you know, a lot of the year in Texas, but uh, um, I, I have a number of projects that uh, that when I get back out to LA in November, I'll be I'll be working on uh, as far as murals go and some really uh, really prime locations. So I'm, I'm I'm excited about that. So you're in Texas, but, now. Uh, but you know. Yeah, I, I, I live in Texas. I, I, my uh, my ex-wife, you know, this is where she, she really wanted to raise kids, and I don't blame her. I thought it was a great idea. So, you know, this is where our daughter was raised, and uh, we had a son together as well. So, uh, you know, I, I just felt like this was there's, – there's a much better opportunity to have a, a more normal kind of upbringing here in Texas than uh, – than the experience that I had in Los Angeles, for sure, and uh, and Los Angeles in general is it's, it's a whole different uh, culture, you know, than uh, than uh, the suburbs of, of Texas. Okay, and, and did you acclimate fine when you moved down there? Well, yeah, because I grew up in Arkansas and Georgia, you know, uh, up until I was uh, you know eleven or so years old. So that that first eleven years, that's a lot of uh, that's that's that's. That's where you get most of, uh, you know, whatever culture you grow up in. By the time you're 11 or 12, you know, it's it's pretty deep rooted. So 
uh, coming back down to the, the slow pace uh, uh, and, and conservative nature of, of the South uh, is certainly different, but it's what I grew up around, so it's not like it's, it's a culture shock for me. Awesome, man. Well, you know what? We're running out of time. I, I want to thank you for coming on. Now, now, what's your Twitter handle? Tell the listeners your Twitter, Twitter handle. Oh, the letters I am and my name, Corin Nemec. I am Corin Nemec, which most people think is for I'm Corin Nemec, like I apostrophe M, but it actually means instant message Corin Nemec because it's Twitter and you're instant messaging me on it. There you go, and you're very so active, you're very active on I Twitter. I am Corin Nemec. So people, instant message Corin Nemec. Follow him, <laughs> and he's very active. And uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Cooper Talk. That's at Cooper Talk. Also, go to my website, uh, www. CooperTalk.net. There's 554 episodes up there. You can also email me, Cooper, at CooperTalk.net. I will get back to you. Instagram and Words with Friends. Yes, I will play you. I'm okay. I'm not great, but it's CooperTalk1, so go there. I post a lot of cool food pictures on Instagram because, as you know, when I had my heart condition a few years ago, I wrote that cookbook, Stop the Salt. You can go to www.stopthesalt.com. It's 120 low-sodium recipes, easy to make. No pictures to imitate you, intimidate you. No big list of ingredients. Just basic, easy cooking for one. So check that out. And also, don't forget, 4hangovers.com, F-O-R-hangovers.com. Go buy some blowfish, put in Cooper, and you get 20% off. So people, please, go check out Corin's past work. Follow him. I am, like instant message, I am Corin Nemec. And follow me at Cooper Talk. Remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, Take your vitamins, and I will talk to you guys next week. All right.